Good afternoon to you. 506 now, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us today at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Spies and thieves being released by the United States government. Five Iranian nationals released by the Biden administration involved in spying and stealing and spinning for terrorists. That's the headline today for the Daily Caller. Meet the prisoners Joe Biden is reportedly freeing for Iran. The Biden administration completed the deal with Iran. Uh, and uh, they're releasing these five American prisoners. They, the Iranians are. Uh, they did release them, uh, and we got them back. That's good. That's the good part of this. But what are we sending? Six billion dollars at least. In fact, some reports are indicating that we are sending well more than sixteen billion dollars to the Iranians. That's the amount that we've unfrozen and sent to the Iranians now. And we've also released five Iranian nationals who have been involved and arrested for a number of crimes, including espionage, conspiracy, theft, and illegally obtaining military equipment and information on Iran's behalf. Uh, for more on this, let's bring in Gabriel Naronha. He's executive director of Polaris National Security and a former State Department advisor on Iran. Gabriel, good afternoon. Good to have you with us. Hey, Vince. Great to be with you. And, you know, I just have to, listening to you say all that, it's important to remember you know, the Americans who were released, these were just innocent tourists and businessmen who the Iranian regime just took hostage on a, on a complete whim. The Iranians who we released, again, you got it right. These are spies, swindlers, um, and, and people who are propagandists for the Iranian regime. Um, that's exactly how the Iranian regime has done this for 44 years. You know, the, the very first act of this regime was taking 52 American diplomats hostage. They held them for a year and a half. Um, that's who these people were dealing with. Is, uh, so this only encourages more interested. of this, though. It's I mean, when you're encouraging them. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Gabriel. But what you're saying, to your point, it, it just encourages the regime to take more innocent Americans hostage in order to secure its policy goals, which include massive funding and, of course, getting all sorts of criminals and terrorists released from U.S. custody. You're absolutely right. In fact, there was actually Iranian generals um, who for years have been saying, you know what, we need to do to improve our economic situation, to balance our budget. We need to take Americans hostage. We need to take five, maybe 50, and we'll get a billion maybe for each of them. And you know what, that's exactly what Biden did just now, $1.2 billion per hostage. Uh, and all that money is going, going to go straight to terrorism. Uh, the Biden administration says it's going to go to food and medicine. I've watched these guys for, for years. It's, that's just not what's going to happen here. It's amazing. Here's an example. One of the guys, Amin Hassanzadeh, he's an Iranian national, a U.S. resident, was charged by prosecutors in 2021 for the theft of technical data from his unnamed employer that was linked to the Iranian government's cruise division of air and space organization. He had access to a, quote, real-time supercomputer with applications that would include aerospace applications, according to an NPR report from the time. Uh, he would then send stolen data back to his brother in Iran, who, of course, was connected to the country's military. So you have this is espionage. You have people stealing U.S. data and technology and sending it to the Iranians. These are the type of people we're now releasing uh, back to Iran. And, you know, what the Iranians say is really interesting. They sort of say we wanted to keep taking Americans hostage so that when our spies get caught in America, we can capture them, we can get them released uh, in exchange. So again, they're saying they're intelligence operatives uh, to America to yes. do their dirty work, and then they know this is their get-out-of-jail-free card. Why wouldn't China do more of this then? If they're watching all of this, I mean, China's big thing is espionage in the United States. They love infiltrating everything they can to steal data from us. Why wouldn't the lesson that they interpret from this be, well, maybe we should take some more Americans into custody and uh, make them hostage and, and uh, we can get our guys back a lot easier. You know, we've already seen a little bit of this. Um, in particular with Canada, um, they've taken a bunch of Canadians hostage because the Canadians had uh, some people that they were doing uh, espionage in Canada. They tried to do that. The Russians have been doing that. They've gotten their arms dealer, uh, you know, the merchant of death, Victor Gao, out. Um, every yeah. time we give our enemies one of these sweetheart deals, it teaches enemies not just in the country we did a deal with, but everywhere across the world 
hey, you can you can make the United States uh, give up your your spies, your terror operatives uh, for for a pretty price. Uh, one of the the Biden administration's State Department spokesman, his name escapes me right now, but uh, he was saying uh, Matthew this, Miller, I think yeah. Matthew Miller. There you go. Yeah, he's got a weird haircut. So this past week, he was talking to the Associated Press's uh, Matt Lee, and in their conversation, uh, Matt brought up I thought what, what was an important point, which is that this money is what we call fungible. We're sending them billions of dollars now. The State Department, Matthew Miller is insisting, well, they can't use it for terrorism. One of the rules is you're not allowed to use it for terrorism. And and uh, Matt Lee's saying, wait a second, if you're giving them six billion dollars to spend on, you know, like keeping the lights on, what are they doing with the money that they had in the first place for keeping the lights on? Look, let, let me tell you a, a little a little anecdote is, uh, you know, this money's supposed to go to food and medicine. Iran's entire medicine budget for this year is $20 million. So this is, I think, 300 times that budget that is supposed to spend on medicine. If, here's exactly what I would do if I were Iran. I buy a bunch of medicine. I'm going to sell on the black market, not just in Iran, but in Afghanistan to the Taliban, in Iraq to our Shia militias. I'm going to send that medicine to our military hospitals. It's not going to a children's hospital. Um, but then they're going to use that money, they sell it, and the proceeds they get, those go to their terror programs. Those go to the, you know, build more torture facilities, go to the secret police. Um, I don't really have to speculate on this. This isn't me just making this up. I've seen this for years and years. Yes. Uh, the U.S. government, even though the Obama administration admitted that things like this was happening. Okay. So there's another piece to this, which is uh, Iran is is very in, involved in the war uh, that Russia is per, uh, is pursuing against Ukraine. We know that. And, and that includes or the Iranians sending weapons and drones to the Russians. So help me understand this. It, it appears to me, and I've, I've been talking about this, that we are funding both sides of the war in Russia and Ukraine. We are providing the very money that's going to be used for weapons for Russia to attack Ukraine. And meanwhile, we're providing weapons to Ukraine to attack Russia. Do I have that right? It's, you, you do, and even when you say it, it sounds ridiculous, and that's exactly what it is. It's a ridiculous policy. You know, this administration doesn't have strategic coherency. The things they do contradict each other. We spend billions and billions of dollars sending weapons to Ukraine, which, you know, in my view is a, is a good thing. But then we're sending billions of dollars to Russia through Iran, um, which is going to go destroy all the weapons we're giving them. They're going to go destroy Ukrainians. So, you know, this isn't just about Iran. This is about uh, the safety and security of Europeans and yes. Ukrainians. Um, and what Biden is doing is he's fueling, frankly, what I call a forever war. He's, he's uh, giving Ukraine just enough to survive, but then he gives Russia uh, enough to continue their war. Sure. You know, their economy is growing by 5% this quarter. That's double what the United States is growing that's 10 times fast, uh, faster than Europe is growing because Biden refuses to sanction Russia. Um, this policy doesn't make sense um, because you don't have adults in the room. That was their big uh, advertisement. They said, you know, we kick out Trump. Yeah. But it's, it's, there are a bunch of people who, are, who have no strategic coherency in their form. Well, the other piece that, that, that Biden is doing is he is driving up the cost of oil around the planet, which is enriching Russia. A fifth of Russia's economy is energy. And they're being enriched by Joe Biden's decision to kneecap American energy production. Uh, and and it's just it's insane. So he's helping Russia pursue its war against Ukraine at the same time that we're dumping all of our precious, uh, you know, treasure and weapons into Ukraine. Uh, and it's again, to your point, it's becoming a forever war. I'm also thinking of as we give this money to Iran, uh, uh, Gabriel, you know, it. what are the Israelis thinking? So we give tons of assistance to Israel, and now we're giving billions and billions of dollars to the Iranians. So now we're funding both sides of that conflict as well? You're right. We, can, we give about $3 billion in, in assistance to, to Israel each year. Now, that's good for American taxpayers um, because the Israelis actually have to buy American weapons. They have to buy from military uh, companies here in the United States. So that creates American jobs. Uh, but then, you know, in this instance, we're giving $6 billion to Iran right in, in one day. 
Um, Iran has been getting about $40 billion a year from its oil sales. Russia is getting about $180 billion a year from its oil sales. This is massive, massive amounts of money that completely contradicts everything that Biden is asking U.S. taxpayers to fork over. So, you know, this is what American taxpayers should be really worried and saying, why are we spending part of our paycheck going to these countries? There's good reasons for, these, for, you know, for us to support Ukraine. There's good reasons for us to support Israel. But if we're going to do that, don't help our out. Don't help our enemies. Don't yeah. help Iran. Don't help Russia. Don't give money to them. Don't jack up the price of oil, which makes them richer. If we're going to spend part of our paycheck helping our allies, let's go all in. And this administration refuses to do the difficult but necessary work to go all in here. It's wild. What do you think is the underlying um, motivation behind the Biden administration's posture towards Iran? Like, why did they think this was a good idea? Is it is it a matter of kind of like lefty delusion around the idea that if we're nice to them, maybe they'll stop being terrorists? Is that the concept? Well, l- let me give let me give you the generous interpretation and then the interpretation I think is real. The, the generous interpretation is they're afraid of Iran's nuclear program, and they're trying to buy them off. They're trying to say, we don't want you to get a nuclear weapon right now. We're busy with Russia. We're busy with China. So here are some concessions so you go away. Um, even in that generous interpretation, that's going to backfire. It's going to kick the can down the road and make the problem a lot harder several years from now. Here's what I think, frankly. Um, I think the Biden administration is trying to reshape the Middle East entirely. Um, they think that we can get Iran on our side to balance out Israel, to balance out Saudi Arabia, countries that, frankly, the Biden administration just doesn't like their leaders uh, and doesn't like how they've been operating. You know, Israel and Saudi Arabia are not perfect, but let me tell you, they do not chant death to America at their rallies every Friday. Uh, Iran does that. And when you try to cozy up to our enemies and get them to change and these snub our allies, it's a recipe for disaster. It's not going to work. It just won't. Yeah. Although I have to say, in, in Saudi's case, you know, they, the Biden administration chose 9/11 to celebrate the partnership with Saudi Arabia. The Saudis, 15 of the hijackers were Saudis, and Osama bin Laden came from a prominent Saudi family. Well, not exactly the time to right. celebrate yeah, the Saudis, right. uh, and uh, that's what the Biden administration did. Uh, Gabriel, really appreciate your time today and your insight on all of these issues. Again, former State Department advisor on Iran and an executive director at Polaris National Security. Thank you, Gabriel. Okay, uh, interesting development here in the last hour or so. Uh, President Trump is responding to some of the criticism he's been receiving for the answer that he gave to Kristen Welker involving Ron DeSantis over the weekend. Um, I, now, I, I did play uh, quite a bit of this yesterday, and, and Trump really, he dunks all over Kristen Welker. She has no idea, or at least she's defending the Democrats and how radical their position is on abortion. Allowing a baby to die on an operating table after it's born, that's uh, the Ralph Northam position. Uh, and Trump threw that in Welker's face, and Welker was like, well, not all Democrats believe that. <laughs> I'm like, what kind of defense is that? What kind of defense is that? But it was this moment that caught so much attention and generated so many headlines. And, of course, there's some people on the right very upset about, with Trump about this. Here is Trump talking about Ron DeSantis signing a ban on abortions for babies with heartbeats. I mean, DeSantis w- is willing to sign a five-week and six-week ban. Would you support that? You think I, that I goes think what he far? did is a terrible thing and a terrible mistake. I think what he did is a terrible thing and a terrible mistake, said Trump. Now, uh, Quite clearly, Trump has seen some of the reaction to this, maybe a lot of it. And he posted to Truth Social here in the last hour the following. I was able to do something that nobody thought was possible. End Roe v. Wade. For 52 years, people talked, spent vast amounts of money, but couldn't get the job done. I got the job done, he says. Thanks to the three great Supreme Court justices I appointed, this issue has been returned to the state's where all legal scholars on both sides felt it should be. Now the pro-life community has tremendous negotiating power. All true so far. That's, that's all true. Like Ronald Reagan before me, I believe in the three exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother, says Trump. Without the exceptions, it's very difficult to win elections. We would probably lose the majorities in 2024 and perhaps the presidency itself. But you must follow your heart, he says. In order to win in 2024, Republicans must learn how to talk about abortion. This issue cost us unnecessarily, but dearly, 
in the midterms. Now, any listener to this show will know how how adamantly pro-life I am. Trump is right about the politics, though. So this is a contentious issue. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who uh, either act as if a life is not involved or pretend, you know, pretend otherwise because they they, you know, they're trying to cope with their support for a party that advances so much death. And it's hard for anybody to to fully swallow that reality. I get it. I get it. And there's no question among among a certain category of left wing female voter, this is apparently one of the most important things to them. That the, the cult of death is that prevalent in the United States. So you have to reckon with that. That's true. That's true as a political matter. But I think so much of the analysis that uh, on this subject has missed the mark. And I said it yesterday and I'll say it again today. Trump is not speaking. When he takes a shot at DeSantis like that, he's not speaking from any fundamental conviction about life or abortion or anything else. He's literally just picking up something that he knows the media wants to use against DeSantis. It was it was just straight up just picking up a random attack on DeSantis and going, maybe this will get me some mileage because Trump doesn't like that DeSantis is running against him. So he'll pick up any weapon he can. It's the same reason his campaign signed on to the stupid attack on DeSantis for improving the black history course in Florida when they were trying to inject Marxism. The left was trying to inject straight up Marxism into it. DeSantis stopped it. That was a very good thing. He had, in fact, the authors of the better policy, of the better curriculum in the state, are great Americans who happen to be black. And Trump jumps in there, his campaign did, and was like, I can't believe DeSantis doesn't want to teach people about slavery. That's not what happened. He just picked up a random attack the left was wielding. So that's a mistake on his part. He shouldn't do that. But again, it's motivated by his win at all costs kind of attitude more so than any particular conviction. Uh, he's right about the fight, though, in terms of what he was able to achieve as president for the issue of life. It's a great thing, and he should run on that and remind people of it. Well, good afternoon to you. It's 536 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us today at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. So much to get to. Uh, we'll talk about some of the presidential campaign stuff. Uh, uh, Donald Trump skipping the primary debate next week uh, for an interesting alternative. And Joe Biden campaigning with the stars. He decided to, he's Broadway Joe, Broadway Joe Biden, <laughs> hanging out uh, with the stars uh, and uh, milking them for campaign cash. That's all coming up. Let's take a phone call, though. We've got Dave calling in from Washington, D.C., line two. Dave, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hey, Vince. Just a real quick observation. The left, once again, is trying to have it both ways. They want us to think that if, uh, if, that our position, our stance on abortion is a political loser for us, but yet they're doing everything they can to run away as quickly as they can from the position that abortion anytime, anywhere, uh, up to and including after birth. Well, you know, if abortion's a good thing, well, then, you know, anytime, anywhere is a good thing. Yes. So they're, they're you know, they're just lying. <laughs> Once again, they're just lying. I know. What does that tell you? So, so if you're a lefty and you're thinking about this, so go ahead, process it a little bit. If the left is embarrassed by the idea of abortion up until birth, which is obviously the platform, if you, if you look at the legislation they tried to pass this past year, uh, what do they call it? The Women's Health Protection Act, I think is what it's called. The idea is that uh, they will allow abortion up until birth, that they're perfectly comfortable with it. It goes far beyond what Roe v. Wade did. It's far more extreme even than that. And Roe v. Wade was already extreme. So if if that's the case, why are they so embarrassed by the position? If abortion doesn't involve killing a human life, then why be embarrassed by your, your politics? Why, why not just exactly. proudly embrace it? Why deny it? <laughs> yeah, it's telling. It's deeply telling. Dave, thank you very much. A smart observation. Uh, and to Dave's point, um, you know, this is so here's the this is the great part of the Trump interview with Kristen Welker. Uh, he straight up says, look, the radicals here are definitely the Democrats. More of this, please. The radical people on this are really the people, the Democrats that say after five months, six months, seven months, eight months, nine months, and even after birth, you're allowed to President, terminate the, Democrats the baby. Democrats aren't saying that. I just have to Democrats are not saying that. Of course That's they do. Not so defensive of Dems, and then Trump uh, fact checks her on the spot. You have a Virginia governor 
previous governor, who said, after the baby is born, you will make a determination, and if you want, you will kill that baby. Well, the Mr. baby President, is now born. Democrats writ large are not talking about that. Only what 1% percent of late-term abortions happen in Always in okay. the state of They the are crisis. the radical people. One percent. Uh, by the way, in some years in the United States, there are a million abortions in the country, a million abortions. Uh, and that's according to places like the Guttmacher Institute, which is a pro-abortion organization that tracks the data here. A million abortions. So what is one percent of a million? Go ahead. Do the math on that. That's 10,000 babies, 10,000 late term abortions in the country, if you're going with the 1% figure. Some years they say it's lower, it's closer to five or 6,000. 6,000 babies, late term? Guttmacher Institute's data shows that, and I, and I've, I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again because there's so many lies on this subject. The majority of late term abortions are healthy babies, healthy mothers. Healthy babies, healthy mothers. They're elective abortions done for the same reasons that abortions are done in the first trimester. That's just true. It's Guttmacher data. Those are the pro-abortion people reporting that. So uh, Trump's like, this is a really radical agenda. This is a super radical agenda. And he brings up Governor Northam, who's a pediatrician, by the way. He's like, I, I tell you what I do. We, we, uh, we deliver the baby, then we lay it on the table, and then we discuss whether or not it survives. He really said that out loud. Trump also played one of his hits, too. He brought up uh, how... Uh, savaging Hillary Clinton in the debate about her radical abortion position. Nobody wants to see five, six, seven, eight, nine months. Nobody wants to see abortions when you have a baby in the womb. I said with Hillary Clinton when we had the debate, I made a statement, rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month. You're allowed to do that, and you shouldn't be allowed to do that. Again, no one and, and is again, arguing listen, for that. That's look, not a part of anyone. She's a liar. She's just a liar. It's literally in the legislation the Democrats put forward this past year. That it's the it's the on paper position of the Democrat Party. Uh, but uh, Wel Welker lies about that. Uh, how do you think these abortions are conducted, Kristen Welker? These late term abortions. How do how do you think the baby is removed? It's it's uh, gruesome stuff, and the left dresses it up in euphemism and lies in order to justify it. And if they're spinning that badly, you know that the underlying position is horrific. You know it. Their behavior tells you everything. Meanwhile, in terms of the presidential campaign, uh, Donald Trump is skipping the debate next week with the auto workers. Oh, excuse me. He's skipping the debate with the Republicans in order to meet with the auto workers. Trump uh, has decided that he's skipping the second GOP presidential debate scheduled for September 27th. He's planning instead to head to Detroit, Michigan. He'll be speaking with plumbers, electricians, and auto workers, a senior Trump campaign advisor confirmed to the Daily Caller, my friends and colleagues there. The United Auto Workers announced a strike on Thursday against Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis, which are Detroit's biggest automakers. Many employees not showing up to work on Friday at a couple of targeted plants. Trump will travel to Detroit to speak to current and former UAW members the night of the second Republican presidential debate. The New York Times was first to report it yesterday. Why was the New York Times first to report that, by the way? It was a, some, somebody made the decision. It, Trump has a special affinity for the New York Times for some reason. I think, I mean, it's his hometown newspaper. So somebody decided to send it to them first. It should have gone somewhere else. The New York Times doesn't treat them fair, never will. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting. Trump meeting with these UAW members, uh, it's very smart for a number of reasons. One, one reason. The debate is going to take place on Fox Business. No other network has access to that footage until the debate has concluded. They're not, you, you play clips, right? You don't play the full debate. This is not like in the general election, everybody has access to the debate feed. All the major networks, they all carry the debate feed. So you can choose the channel you wanna watch a general election debate on. Not so with these primary debates. The primary debates are in one location. And Fox, if, there's any, if history is any guide, in the last debate, they would only allow broadcasts to share something like three minutes of audio. So you get very little that you could draw upon from actual content according to their um, requirements and as th that they laid down. So I guess they'll probably do the same thing with the Fox Business debate. Trump speaking with the United Auto Workers, any network that wants to set a camera up and capture that feed, they can have that audio and, th and that video. That can be up live all over the place. Now, will it be? No, it's unlikely because the corporate press is 
anti-covering anything Trump does raw these days. To the extent that you see Trump at all, it's through a heavy distortion filter in the corporate media. But there are a number of places that'll carry some Trump, for sure. There are a couple places out there. The internet will definitely be one of them. So for Republican primary voters who may want to opt out of the debate, don't want to see it, and instead want to watch something else involving politics if they're interested, Trump's going to be available that night. Trump's doing this, this address. He's going to meet with all these guys. There's also some uh, conversation apparently going on that Trump may join the picket line. That, and so we'll see. There, there may be some uh, Secret Service elements to that kind of decision. They may not want to fully reveal when and where he might join something like that. Uh, but that could be kind of interesting and provocative. He's definitely outmaneuvering Biden on this. Can you imagine? Biden would never join a picket line. Biden could barely walk down a stage. How is he going to walk along a picket line? If Trump does, it'll be interesting. Now, of course, what you know, some people interpret that as, well, that's a full endorsement of every demand that the union leadership has made. If you walk the picket line, you clearly support all of the specifics that the UAW's leadership have laid out. And I don't think you could say that, actually, about Trump, because remember what Trump's position here on the strike has been. He wants the auto workers, many of whom support him, to pressure their union leadership to put the screws to Biden to say no more electric vehicle mandates. This is destroying our industry. This is destroying us. This is enriching China. It is exporting like all of these jobs. You are distorting the market. This is not a free market. When the government comes in and forces all of these companies to go EV, these crappy, unreliable cars, and you're, it's leading to American workers being laid off like crazy. You want to fight for American workers? Fight to get rid of the cancer that's destroying their jobs. Fight to do that. Allow us to have an actual free market, actually protect these auto workers, actually protect these jobs. So Trump, Trump has his own take on all of this. But if you're wondering whether or not union members support Trump, look no further than the 2016 and 2020 elections. They clearly do. And it's clearly a source of panic on the left that there are members of unions who've broken off from the Democrat stranglehold. And they're saying, you know what? I'm not being served well by you. There's a story... Uh, here for you. The New York Times has a quote from a woman called Jennifer Banks, a 29-year-old Ford employee among the auto workers who are striking. And she told the New York Times this. She said, quote, I think our president at Biden is not as strong a president as we need, said Jennifer Banks. Quote, I'm hoping somebody can replace him. I hope it doesn't leave me no choice but to vote the other way, she says. And what does that mean? Vote the other way. Well, obviously for the Republican candidate. That means that's what the other way here is. So you've got a woman. She's a member of a union. She doesn't feel uh, taken care of by certainly the company. She wants, she wants, their, their collective bargaining is trying to argue for uh, bigger pay raises. And everybody wants a pay raise now, by the way. And it makes terrible sense because every American has lost money during the Biden administration. How about a little collective bargaining for all of us? I mean, we are... Poorer now than before Joe Biden came into office. Everybody, everybody. There's very few exceptions to that because your money doesn't go as far at all. Everything is dramatically more expensive. So built into this consideration, obviously you've looked at some of these auto workers. I think, what are they arguing for? Like 40 something percent pay raise. And most of us see that and we're like, that's a huge number. It is a huge number of 40 something percent pay raise. That'd be a massive thing. Can you imagine you get a 40 something percent pay raise? You go home to your wife, you're like, guess what, baby? I got a 40 something percent pay raise. That's a big deal. She'd fall in love with you again. But a lot of that is actually just making up for Biden, quite honestly. Just the Biden era has, I mean, what what are you actually going, what are the numbers? It's like, you know, they're really actually only asking for like a 20% pay raise based on what Joe Biden has done to them in real terms. So it's just, you know, it's just wild to see this happening. But you have union members who are saying, look, I've, I've always been a Democrat. This Jennifer Banks character, she's a young woman. She's probably lifelong Democrat voter to the extent she's voted at all. Ford employee. She's striking. She thinks Biden's not strong. She's hoping the Democrats come up with a replacement soon or else she's going to have to vote for the Republican. 
Donald Trump. And guess who's showing up? Donald Trump. He's the one. So a smart move on his part. And it is, if you look back at the last debate, what happened when Trump didn't show? It was a big, you know, it was a question mark. What was going to happen? Who was going to gain? Did Vivek Ramaswamy have a standout performance? And on and on and on. And the reality is everybody else was just kind of an also ran at the end of that debate. And Trump picked up more support. He didn't even show up and he picked up more support. That's just true. So why wouldn't he do it again? It worked for him before. Why not do it again? And in fact... You know, instead of sitting down with Tucker Carlson this time, which he did last time, he'll go out there and he'll make a big splashy news event out of meeting with the auto workers, people who are suffering under Biden like so many of us. And one last point on this auto worker business. The American auto industry was destroyed by people like Joe Biden. And when I say people like Joe Biden, people who include Joe Biden. The current plight of the American auto industry and the collapse of so many of those good jobs in our country you can point fingers directly at Washington for so many of those decisions, especially when it comes out to comes comes uh, comes to selling us out to not countries engaging in free trade with us, throwing quotation marks around that. It's people who are engaged in unfair trade practices, who are exploiting and and stealing our intellectual property, who are using slave labor who are destroying the environment in the pursuit of the, 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 for instance, the batteries that are going into all these electric vehicles. It's a total scam. We're outsourcing everything to a country that's engaged, to China in this case, in many cases, that's engaged in ridiculous, unfair trade practices. And that was Joe Biden. Joe Biden was right at the center of all of that. Like for him to even pretend he's on the side of the auto workers after all he's done to destroy their livelihoods, that's bold. That's brazen, for sure. And, uh, you know, Trump's going to go out there and try and highlight that next week. So that'll be interesting. As always, keeping things interesting. 551 now. Uh, Jim and Lesby here. Line two. Jim, you're on the Vince Colonnais show. Vince, you're missing something in your 46% increase of the, the wages. They're also asking for a 32-hour work week, which when you put it all together, it's going to be over a 70% increase yeah. in their hourly wage by the end of this contract it is huge they don't and, want just the money yeah and they're also asking for a cost of living adjustment which which account which would account for all that inflation too so the, yeah there's a it's a very big ask from the uaw leadership you know what's interesting jim is that the audio companies have offered them a 20 percent wage increase though to break the standoff here right. uh, and uh, that would mean that they would be back on parity with where they were when joe biden came into office because inflation's gone up by about 20 yeah. percent Exactly. Vince, I am a union member, or I should say I am a life member of the Communication Workers of America as a retired Verizon employee. Yeah. And as a union member, I think this is terrible. Well, there you go. You heard it from a union member. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, no, there's uh, some difference of opinion there. Union membership, it turns out, is uh, very divided on a lot of this stuff. And uh, the evidence of that can be found in the welcome that Donald Trump is going to receive next week as he hangs out with these auto workers, and we figure out what happens next. I can tell you what's happening next here. The great one, Mark Levin, up next on WML.